Welcome to another edition of the China Forum. My name is Carrie Dumbaugh. Earlier in this series, we spent a half hour with Ambassador James Lilly, former ambassador to China, uh, as he recalled some of the highlights of his very distinguished career. Uh, I said at the time that he had such a distinguished career and we had so little time that I wasn't sure that we would get through all of it in just a half hour. And indeed, we did not. So we are back here for part two of our conversation with Ambassador Lilly. Thank you very much for being here again and coming Thank again you, to... When we last left you, I think it was 1980, that's as far as mm -hmm. we got, uh, and Reagan had, uh, President Reagan had just been elected, and we had a few bumpy years in U.S.-China relations. Uh, his early statements as a candidate, I think, talked about renormalizing relations with Taiwan, so things were a little bit uh, difficult. You expressed concern early in the Reagan administration. I think you were quoted as saying that, that you were afraid the Department of State had fallen into pro-PRC hands. Well, I, I suppose that's a little, little harsh. Uh, there tends to be an institutional thought in the State Department which derives back from John Payton Davies, Jack Service, the people who wrote from Yan'an that were McCarthy, uh, this idea was that this set back Chinese-American relations. And I think people felt that these had to be restored. This was a very valuable relationship. And they had played a role in restoring the relationship, and they wanted to keep it. And they considered Taiwan as an obstacle to that relationship. Although a lot of them had served in Taiwan, they were fond of it. But yet, in the geopolitical calculus, Taiwan did not wasn't that important. And we were had this major problem with the Soviet Union. China was against the Soviet Union. We had moved together with China as a result of our common concern about Soviet hegemony. But Reagan came in with a different viewpoint. He came through with the idea that Taiwan was our good old friend. And we stood by our friends. And he didn't really know China at that time. So he was predisposed to be favorable to Taiwan, and he didn't want to normalize. He wanted to reestablish official relations. And then he dropped that. He dropped that fairly quickly. That must uh, have been of great concern to, the, to Beijing at that It was. I was over on the trip with Vice President Bush, I guess it was in August uh, 1980, and the Chinese were very concerned at that time. Deng Xiaoping and others were very concerned, expressed this concern. We carried it back. And then we gave it to President Reagan. He made this August 25th statement, 1980, in which he spelled out, look, his intention was to hold out the hand of friendship to all Chinese, including the Chinese in Taiwan, and to be friendly with them was in our interest. And uh, then, of course, at that time, there had been a very strong criticism of the way the Carter people had, had implemented the Taiwan Relations Act. And they hadn't carried through on reestablishing branch offices, doing various things, resuming arms sales and this kind of thing. And Reagan said, we're going to move ahead on this thing, be our friend of Taiwan and be a friend of China too. Well, both sides were trying to maneuver us. Taiwan pushing the envelope, China coming in and saying, stop right here. So Reagan didn't necessarily cause this. The Chinese and Taiwan were squaring off. And they were both trying to use the United States against the other one. So this was the state for a couple of years. I remember it was no, a very difficult time. It lasted time. until about August 82, yeah, when the, in the August communique. And it lasted roughly for about a year and a half. Right. Before we get to the August communique, Secretary Haig went to Beijing, or maybe a Foreign Minister Huang Hua came here. They Huang discussed, Huang came here, yeah. They discussed the issue of... U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Right. What was Secretary Haig's solution to that? Well, at, at that time, he was very irritated by Huang Hua's approach, which was quite hostile to Taiwan. And I think Secretary Haig wanted to move ahead with Taiwan, but he wanted to do it gradually, carefully, and in tune with our larger interests with China. He called it the strategic imperative. And, uh, but the momentum of the thing was forcing his hand. And the Chinese wanted to move on this very quickly. They wanted to block a resumption of arms sales. They wanted to make sure we had no official contacts with Taiwan. They wanted to keep us right to the letter of this thing. And I think Secretary Haig felt terrific pressure from them. And the Foreign Service, I think many of them were telling him, you have to do this. 
because this is in our national interest. Taiwan is secondary to this. But I think Secretary Hagen, in, in you know, deference to him, he, he did want to resume sale, arms sales to Taiwan. But he thought you ought to keep the symbolic aspects very low. But we got into the negotiations on the arms sales, which became rather uh, strong. But one of the important things that was done, just as before I went to Taiwan as the director of the American Institute, the equivalent of our ambassador there in January 82, Reagan turned down the sale of F-16s or F-5Gs to Taiwan. And this, we had done a careful study of this, and we said, we don't need, they don't need it. I remember that. Based yeah. on the Taiwan Relations Act. So he turned, the Taiwan authorities were disappointed. And I arrived the day they turned it down, just about. And of course, I started off in that foot, but the Taiwan authorities knew that I had nothing to do with it. And they didn't make my life tough on this one. Oh, maybe a little bit, but not much. But Reagan had done this, and this, this was a clear signal to China. But I'm afraid that China saw that this was a time to push real hard. And so they did. A termination of arms sales. And, and they pushed very hard. And the result was the 1982 communique on right, arms sales. Right, right. Now, I want to ask you about this because in your interview with uh, Charles Stuart Kennedy, you talked about the Reagan codicil right. to the Taiwan, uh, to the communique on arms sales. Tell us about right, that. Right, right. Well, the, the basic idea of the communique was we re only recognize one China and that arms sales to Taiwan will diminish both in quantity and quality as tensions diminish. There was this linkage. That it, that's not specified, though. It, it's in, in there. It's in there. You look at it, it it's, it's implicit. It's implicit, implicit. But, uh, uh, but the linkage is between these arms sales will, will decrease in quantity and quality, n not over the level of the 1979, as tensions diminish. Implicitly, it means if you don't resort to force, we will cut arms. See, I don't remember the as tensions diminish. I, rem look at, look I at remember it. leading it, to an it's ultimate... It's in the Shanghai uh, communique, and it's in this communique. The peaceful, peaceful solution is definitely in there. As tensions diminishes in there, too. Okay. Okay. So what, what President Reagan gets a hold of this thing, he said, this is all wrong. This thing caught up with me, and I didn't like it in the beginning. I don't think we should have ever, got, ever gotten into this thing, and I'm going to give you my thinking on this. And he... he he and Judge Clark worked out, along with, I think, some others, a, their thinking on it, which uh, he says explicitly, arms sales to Taiwan will be governed by two factors. One, a steady Chinese commitment to peaceful resolution. If this changes, arms sales change. Second, if the balance of power in the Taiwan Strait drastically changes, arms sales change. Meaning increase. Arms sales could increase if... He, he says your sales to Taiwan will be governed by these two factors. Clearly this means if China upgrades its own capability, you upgrade Taiwan's. If China starts having live fire exercises, fires missiles, whatever it does, if it starts to increase the tension towards war, then you have to do something. Now this was his understanding and it became the White House's understanding? It became a document that was given to Gaston Seeger, who was then the senior man on Asia in the National Security Council, and later became Assistant Secretary of State, replacing Paul Wolfowitz in 86. Uh, they, they were guided by this, and when arms sales came up for Taiwan after this, the first one was what we call the indigenous defense fighter. Now, since we turned down the F-16s and the F-5Gs, then we said we will help Taiwan build their own fighter, General Dynamics, which includes advanced avionics. This avoids the letter of the August communique, because it's technology transfer, it's not weapon systems. So we did that. We had a big fight on that, and it prevailed. The, the people supporting this, namely, I think, Paul Wolfowitz, Rich Armitage, Gaston Seeger, and myself, we got it under strong resistance from the bureaucratic establishment. We got it because the Reagan codicil. The Reagan codicil, but, but nobody knew about this. I mean, this was very closely held. Oh, yeah, it was very, there's no paper trail. Uh, and then this led on to the arms sales of the uh, frigates, the uh, helicopters, 
the C-130s. And at this time, China was not really that threatening. Uh, but we felt that the Taiwan defensive establishment had, had been denuded uh, during the Carter years. And we'd held up arms, there's a moratorium for over a year on arms sales to Taiwan. And China had this gigantic fleet of airplane planes, 5,000 jets, and this gigantic army and uh, a navy based on Soviet models, which they'd gotten in the 60s. So they had a pretty impressive military force in terms of size. And they were, they begin to talk more in terms of, let's say, unification rather than liberation. And this was Ye Jinying's nine-point statement of, of September 1979, I think it was. We were moving in the direction of a better situation. But the idea was that you always enhanced Taiwan's bargaining position by giving them both moral and material support. And a lot of people challenged this. And the payoff really didn't come until 1987, 89. No, let's stick back with 1982 okay, for a bit okay. because uh, it's 1982 and right. we have lurking in the, in the deep, deep background, the Reagan codicil. Mm -hmm. uh, were succeeding administrations uh, operating under the same policy approach or was that something well, just I would, in the I Reagan administration? Well, I would say this. Uh, certainly during the Reagan administration it prevailed. Uh, during Bush 41's administration, it prevailed once. That was the, sale the F-16. Of 150 F-16s to Taiwan after China had gotten the Su-27s from Russia. Right. China had substantially increased its military capability by purchases of aircraft and other military equipment, SA-10s things like this from Russia. So therefore, the justification is to keep the balance according to the Reagan thinking. This should be done. Now, whether the decision was based on that or the politics of Texas, I can't say. But the Maybe decision, a little of both. And I can't say. I was just a drone. But it, it, uh, it, was, it was approved, but the same thinking prevailed that it was healthy to keep a balance of power in the strait. Did we ever discuss this, the Reagan codicil, I guess, with uh, Beijing? I mean, no, were they, no, this no, was just... No, absolutely not. And... Very few people knew about it. Without a paper trail. I never saw it until three years ago. And, and there was a piece of paper that you saw three years ago? Mm -hmm. um, if I could just jump to yeah. the current administration. Sure. Um, we have a lot of the same players in, well, some of the key yeah. players yeah. in the current administration. True that we did back when the Reagan codicil was formed. Right. Uh, it, and that would suggest that this team is very much operating under that thinking again. No, I don't think so. This, this team has changed. It evolves. People don't stay the way they were 20 years ago. Uh, the key people involved, of course, people like Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Rich Armitage, Gaston is dead, of course, Gaston Seeger, Jim Kelly is here, Easton State. Some of the players are still here. Uh, but they, they, they think new. They, don't, they aren't locked into this kind of thing. They, they look at it in the way that their own president today looks at it, Bush 43. And uh, I would say that some of the thinking in Bush 43's administration was influenced by what they perceived as the early mistakes made by Reagan administration. That this whole business of getting into China in this, in this long, gorgeous debate over the August communique and threatening to break relations, downgrade relations. All these things went through. It was really brinksmanship and it tied U.S. in knots for months. This time, it seems to me that the Hainan incident, EP3 incident, 1 April 2001, gelled our thinking. And it's very important, very early in the administration, to lay out your position clearly. A we will defend Taiwan. B, we will back this up with a arms sales package, but which does not include Aegis. Therefore, we are sensitive to Chinese concerns. C, Chen Shui-bian will be treated with dignity and respect when he comes here, but he will meet no officials, not kept in a hotel room. And four, we will see the Dalai Lama. We will get this behind us right away. It still seems a lot like the, like the Reagan Carter no, no. soap. But I think the difference is that you, we went on for a year and a half in the Reagan administration before we reached the point where we had stability. 
This time, I think they tried to establish it within the first six months. Because of these early, this first two years of the, the EP3 administration. forced our thinking into dealing with the military situation right off the bat. And then, very wisely, I think Bush 43's team went to WTO and economics within one month. Bob Zellick was in Shanghai starting negotiations again on getting China in the WTO. And then we did not object to their getting the Olympics. A lot of signals were given to China that were positive. Bush was going to come for the APEC meeting in October. Bang, bang, bang. This thing was going to move. And the momentum was started to keep the relationship going. I think it was quite superior to what we did in 1981. Well, let's go back then, since this is really a, a, you're sharing your memories with us. I didn't mean to drag us off to the present, but no. um, in 1982, you discussed in, in some of your interviews that you thought that um, not only did we have the opening up to China, but we were more assertively dealing with Taiwan, that uh, there was a dual approach uh, right. early in the Reagan administration. Right. That uh, Explain uh, what that approach was. All right, you well, were... let, me, let me give you an example of how this works. The theory was that we had, which was contested by some of our friends in state, the career service, was that namely if you gave Taiwan, Taiwan confidence and, and strength, they'd be more inclined to deal with China in a way that would lower tensions. And this was the thought. That's why these arms sales were made, basically. But in the indigenous defense fighter, there was an implicit linkage that Taiwan would stand still in the Asian Development Bank for Beijing's entry as the People's Republic of China, and they would change their name from Republic of China to Chinese Taipei. That took two and a half years to negotiate, but it was a really significant breakthrough. Here they were sitting in an official relationship, in an organization right next to each other. And, but with Taiwan, Taiwan got the indigenous defense fighter with advanced avionics. So it seemed a good trade-off. China gets into the ADB, Taiwan stays in. It wasn't like the World Bank where China walked in and said, we come in, they're out. They were out. You were in Taiwan during these early years. You just said you were going off to be uh, the uh, director of right. AIT. Um, this was before Taiwan's uh, political reformation, I right, guess. Right. Um, and so when you were there, you met personally and alone with Jiang Jingguo and with Li Denghui. Exactly. What yes. were your impressions back then? Jiang Jingguo was physically a very weak man. He had the last stages of diabetes, and he could barely walk, and his, his extremities were all dying. But his mind was just as clear as a bell. He couldn't see well, great characters written on the page, but his mind was very, very good. And he showed great vision at that time. He, he said, I have a four-point plan for Taiwan. He said this way before I got there. A, I am going to democratize Taiwan. B, I'm going to turn over power to the Taiwanese. C, I'm going to maintain economic prosperity. And D, I'm going to open up to China, B, B, C, D. And every bit of that was carried out. And Li Denghui? Li Denghui did not, came in in 88 when, after Jiang Jingguo died with Jiang Jingguo's legacy. He's a different man, a very different man. But he knew that Jiang Jingguo wanted this to happen. Taiwan began to become democratic. The Taiwanese began to take over. Prosperity was raging. And the opening to China took place. And, and all these things happened because there was a sense of confidence in Taiwan that the Americans would stand with them. So you left Taiwan in 1984. Right. Uh, a brief stint in the private sector. Right. Uh, and in 1985, you became Deputy Assistant Secretary of State yeah, for East Paul Asia. Yeah, under Paul Wolfowitz and then Gaston Seeger, right. Did you find this ironic, considering some of the problems you'd had with the State Department throughout your no, career? No, I had many friends there in the State Department. Uh, there are some people who thought I was a, not a very desirable addition to the State Department, but I, I, lots of people were with me on this thing. I felt confident that, that I'd have good support there. Uh, actually, you only spent uh, a short time there. You about went year, off... About a year and a half. You and went then off they asked me to go to Korea. As ambassador. Right, right. Tell us what you found in Korea. 
Well, Korea was uh, probably the most exciting period of my life. I came there in uh, 86, late 86, replaced my old friend Dixie Walker, and uh, it was in the throes of, of something close to martial law. There were violence, there were demonstrations in the street, there was a authoritarian military government that was not elected, and uh, the crisis was building. And as it moved on, there were hundreds and thousands of people in the equivalent of Korea's Tiananmen Square, demonstrating for democracy, anti-corruption, opening the system, all this sort of thing. The difference was the Americans, I think, played a supporting role to the Korean government insisting that they don't use the tactics that they used in Kwangju in 1980 of smashing it. And you were del having to deliver this message. I delivered that ambassador. message and I had studied the Kwangju thing very closely. And I knew we had to get our own military on board and we had to approach the South Koreans in a pretty firm position. And, and President Reagan was behind us, Gaston Seeger was very much behind us, and I was the instrument. In, in, in Seoul for doing this. And I felt very comfortable with Gaston and Rich and people like this behind me in, in the government. And we did make our démarche, and uh, Chun De Hwan, who was then the president, did not use force. He was just about ready to use it. And so it's American influence. Well, no, it, it was his own general said, don't do it. We, we, it, we weren't pulling strings that way. I mean, he would listen to us, but he would then make his own decision. Now, how long were you in Korea? How long were you About in Korea? A little over two years. So this all happened within that time. Yeah, frame. and then we had the Olympics coming, you see. And when the Koreans make a decision, as was made then, and No Tae Woo was then the heir apparent, No Tae Woo makes this dramatic move for democracy in June 29th, 1987. Mm. Eight points for democracy. Amnesty, direct elections, new election law, new constitution. Bang, bang, bang. And they did it. They did it. And they had the election, and uh, Do Tae Woo won with something like 39% of the vote. Kim Dae Jung and Kim Young San split the other rest of the vote. The, the two dissidents, the one who's president today. And uh, Do Tae Woo won, and he was determined to bring democracy to Korea. He was very instrumental in doing this. And a quiet military man, but he really felt that this was the only answer. And democracy came, and they began to elect their National Assembly, and their governors, and their mayors, and the president. And it was an exhilarating time. Um, you left. I, I don't. Let's skip over what uh, you did when you came back, because I want to get to um, 1989. You're sure. posting in. I'm, I'm not saying that it's it's your presence in a country that leads to demonstrations, and but in fact, uh, this has happened to you uh, several times. Uh, you were made ambassador to China just at the time that the yeah, same right. kind of thing was exactly. happening. It's in I, South Korea. I left Korea in January 1989. I came back home, and then uh, President Bush appointed me ambassador to China to replace Winston Lord. And I arrived in China on 2 May 1989. And of course, as you know, the massacre took place on 4 June. And uh, I arrived right in the middle of massive demonstrations. Ironically, Shirley Guo, the Minister of Finance for Taiwan, was there in Beijing, attending an Asian Development Bank meeting. Tell me what uh, some of your, this was such a, a, a tumultuous time yeah. in China. What are some of the things that stick out most in your service there? Well, I think the big difference between the American role in Korea and the American role in China is in Korea we had direct access to the top leadership and we had tremendous leverage in the existence of our military and security alliance against North Korea. In China we lacked that. We did not have direct access to the top leadership and the Chinese cut us off as they did during the EP3 incident as they do when they get into a crisis. So you and, were basically it, without conversations for a only while? With, a, uh, with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. That was the level. But he went right to Li Peng, right to the top and our messages could get through. But the other thing is your leverage was limited. And uh, we, now that I read the Tiananmen papers, I see that I would have done things slightly differently had I had that information available at that time. For example, I would have asked that Brett Scowcroft and Larry Eagleburger come out in late May, before Tiananmen, to make that top-level intercession 
right with Dung. Because as we read the papers, we see that he was being fed false information by not only the mayor of Beijing, but by others. And we were without, really, without that We couldn't get there and leverage. get him the true story, that there would be very severe consequences if he used military power. I could do that to a degree in Korea. I could not do that in China. And I think if I had it to do over again, I would have done this. The Chinese could have very well said, don't come. Well, but, uh, you, how long did this difficulty go on? I mean, on this side, remember, at least six months of, of uh, turmoil and considering legislation for sanctions. It what was it like for you? It, actually, uh, it, it was a very bitter time. And of course, the whole thing was played on TV for, to a fairly well. We had Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw, Bernie Shaw. We're all there covering it. The Gorbachev Dung meeting, the meeting of the two great communist powers, they came to cover that. Absolutely. And the story was in the square. And we had a, a naval ship visit in Shanghai in mid-May, cementing Chinese-American military relationships. I went down there and went to the ships, and we got together and said, look, you're out of here. You're not coming to Peking. Yeah. Oh, they were supposed to come to... to yes. Oh. You're out of here. And they left. Yeah. And there was been no flap after that. Imagine if you'd had an admiral of the Seventh Fleet in Beijing two weeks before Tiananmen. Yeah. He wasn't. He left. So uh, we tried to get the word to the Chinese, use restraint, but it takes a lot more than that. And you were there, uh, we're just about out of time, unbelievably again. Maybe we sure, need sure, a third sure. show, but you were there, and, and when did you come back to the I United came back States? in uh, May of 91. At that time, there were still very strong feelings in the Congress and the media against China. They wanted to keep sanctions. They wanted to link most favored nation to human rights. Uh, they wanted to cut, keep all military contacts cut off. These things were very strong in Congress, and I think it was quite unfortunate because I tried hard to get most favored nation extended. We did, by just a few votes, actually, to, to sustain Bush's veto. And uh, it was a time of poisonous atmosphere and there was very strong domestic pressures in the United States against China. I was very surprised when I came back because we had worked to restore the relationship in terms of intellectual property rights, science and technology agreement, a property agreement, uh, education agreement, and we come back and we see this total hostility. Yeah, it's, I'm going to have to stop you there, but you have many more memories, okay. I know. I want to thank you so okay. much for this incredibly interesting conversation. I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us with Ambassador Lilly. Uh, good night, bye, and we'll see you next time. Okay.